Welcome to the Truth Be Known podcast, bringing you the objective truth boldly, candidly, and without apology. Welcome to this week's episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Truth Be Known podcast. I'm Nathaniel Jolly. And I am Eki Tepsipornchai. And uh, guys, it's good to be back with you again uh, week to week. And uh, I'm sure you enjoy seeing Eki's face as much as I do. Uh, but we have uh, another special guest with us this week. We've been kind of pre-recording because I'm going to be in California for a few weeks here. Last week, um, or the last episode, we had Jim Osmond on. And uh, this week we've got uh, Mr. James Coates. Is it Jane? Is it is it Doctor James Coates? I, I don't know what's your. Technically, it is. I, I completed yeah, okay. the ministry back in 2020. Yeah. Uh, so we've got James Coates with us. Um, J- James, a, a lot of our listeners will know who you are, um, but we may have a, a lot of listeners who don't know who you are. So why don't you just give us a few minutes? Uh, where are you serving the Lord? Tell us a little bit about your ministry, your walk there, and then we'll kind of jump into our topic for today. Yeah, I've been pastoring Grace Life Church now for 13 years. In fact, the anniversary for the 13th year is July 2nd. So just coming up on that this Sunday. And uh, here in Edmonton, Alberta, have been in Edmonton for 13 years. I'm from Toronto originally, went to the Master's Seminary for my MDiv and Doctor of Ministry. And uh, Grace Life obviously was a church that came under a lot of attention during uh, the, uh, the, the COVID era. And, uh, and our church has really grown spiritually and, and, and numerically as a result of that. So uh, things are, are busy at Grace Life Church and our ministry is, is full and it's, uh, it's been a, a blessing to see the Lord work in this season. Hey, James, for those who may not be familiar with what you went through, can you just give us a, a few sentences summarizing what happened with the COVID shutdown and, and what you went through that led to this amazing church growth? Yeah, though we though we complied initially and reluctantly, we we became convicted in the summer of 2020 that our doors should be open, and uh, and so we opened our doors, and things were going along smoothly until the next health emergency was declared in the fall, at which time we had AHS, which is our our health governing body, and the RCMP, which is our police, coming to our services, and they the government basically employed every tool they possibly could to get us to submit up to and including me being imprisoned. And I, I wasn't jailed because what I did warranted that by law, but I was given a condition of release that I was not willing to sign because it would have infringed on my ability to fulfill my role as a pastor. And so in not in not signing my condition, refusing to sign that, I was ultimately sent to a maximum security prison for 35 uh-huh. days until my condition of release could be adjusted to terms that I could agree to by conscience. And so that happened after 35 days. And so my, my life in our church garnered really world as a result of that. And, uh, and so, uh, and, and, and a lot of that drew attention to Grace Life Church. Now I will say this, you've got voices out there that would say that churches that stayed open, um, were growing not with people being saved, but with uh, people just leaving churches that were closed. And Mm, we, we just finished, and I don't normally reference numbers of baptisms or anything else. We just finished 22 baptisms over three Sundays. And this is a number of, 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 we do baptisms about twice a year, sometimes three times a year. And, and the numbers have been, have been high uh, each time, but the number of people whose testimonies dovetail with our stand and in some cases, they were saved as a result of our church being opened is significant. And, and you know, for churches that didn't stay open, I, I guess one of the ways to kind of like, as an apologetic to think through in terms of supporting why it's so important to stay open is when are you ever going to hear a testimony of someone saying they came to Christ because the church was closed? Mm. It's probably mm-hmm. never going to happen. Um it's it's yeah. it's probably not going to be that that a person is going to say I came to Christ because you were so obedient to the government and because you were so committed to loving the community by preventing the, right. the spread of COVID nineteen and and, yeah. and it was through that that I was just convinced that Jesus is Lord and 
and and I believed on him was saved. I just don't think you're going to hear that testimony. So there there becomes a bit of a you know a practical apologetic for why it's important to keep the church open. Yeah. And and if I'm not mistaken, I think um, the week after you were arrested, the following Sunday, um, your church had like the largest attendance ever. I uh, could be, yeah. I yeah. mean, we like we just. I mean, I'm sure it's been surpassed since then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we 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 just like two Sundays ago because of the baptisms that that attracts extended family and stuff like that. We had almost a thousand in attendance, wow. and uh, so our our attendance has even grown since then for sure. And this is a good Amazing. segue into our topic today, because the point of all that is uh, really has nothing to do with all the political, you know, maneuvering and and positions and things like that. The 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 whole reason the, the the church is in opposition to being closed is because the church has a specific role to fulfill, um, and the the church has its own governing ruler, right, which is Christ. Um, and it, you know, I love to hear about uh, the people coming to Christ in your church uh, because there, there's a reason they got saved when they came. It's because they heard a particular message, right? They're, they're, they're hearing the gospel message, the need for Christ. They're they're hearing of the uh, the the condition of man and what God demands because of that sinful condition and what the solution is. And so today, we just kind of want to talk about. Um, I, I think the, the the need for Christians to stay laser focused on the world being a mission field, because it, one of the things that I, I think everyone observed in, in the midst of all of that, which is pretty new in the Western world, right? I've, I've spent a great deal of time on the African continent and things like that aren't necessarily new. Persecution is not new for the church at large, but in the Western world, we've not seen um so much pressure on the church like we did during COVID. And of course, now there are other movements, uh, you know, uh, the LGBTQ movements and things like that, that are are increasingly putting pressure on the church. And so I think that there's there can be a, a human tendency to look at these things and sort of develop kind of um, a combative stance that doesn't necessarily see people through a spiritual lens uh, the way that we ought to. Um, but more kind of in a secular lens. And so maybe, James, uh, as we're talking about really the importance of uh, Christians maintaining a gospel witness and a love for the lost that would compel us to share the gospel, why don't you just kind of start this conversation by uh, defining the gospel? Because there, there's, a, there's a large segment of the church that basically says the gospel's everything. Right. If you closed your church, that was the gospel. If you love your neighbor by taking a shot, that was the gospel. Uh, none of that's actually true. The gospel is a pretty narrowly defined thing. So why don't you start there and then just kind of lead us into that conversation about the need to maintain uh, the right view and how we look at people? Well, I think you want to start the conversation in the right place because you've got to define what the gospel is and. I'm pretty narrow in the way that I define that. And I think that I'm consistent with the apostle Paul in the way I define the gospel. The gospel is expressed most clearly and succinctly in first Corinthians 15. Uh, and there Paul identifies that he has submitted to the Corinthians, that which is of first importance that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures that he was raised, uh, on the third day, according to the scriptures. So, so his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins is the gospel. And so we can kind of expand on that a little bit and talk about God the Father sending his son into the world. We can talk about Christ and his perfect life, his, his sacrificial death, his resurrection, his ascension. But when push comes to shove, the gospel revolves around the death and resurrection of Christ. And so that is the message that must be be believed to be saved. Uh, Paul even front loads verses three and four, first Corinthians 15, by talking about the gospel being that by which you are saved, that which in you stand. And so the it's the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that is, is the gospel. And, uh, and I think that's critically important. You know, right now there's a big discussion that revolves around the kingdom. And, and you can see how in Matthew, for example, Jesus refers to the gospel of the kingdom 
And, and there's a sense in which I want to say the gospel of the kingdom is the death and resurrection of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Now, if you want to limit the gospel of the kingdom and let that genitive modify gospel a little bit there and say that the gospel is the coming kingdom, well, I would say, yes. Yeah, so Christ is going to return in judgment to establish his kingdom. And if you want to be a part of that kingdom, you must repent of your sin and believe in Christ. And, and specifically believing the gospel, his death and resurrection. So I really think that when it comes to the gospel, we need to be rigid, narrow, and crystal clear that the gospel revolves around what Christ has accomplished for our reconciliation with God. And that's what he did through his cross and resurrection. Yeah, amen. And and so uh, James and that I and that's an, that's necessary to define it like that today because again, you can go to any bookstore, at least here in the U.S., and if you can find a theologically sound one, I'd be amazed these days. But you, you can pick up a book, and the, the gospel has just been so diluted that I think a lot of believers have kind of missed the, the the narrow focus there. So, James, let me ask you this question. All three of us are pastoring churches. Um, I, I know, especially after the COVID incident, um, I've had to help people work through how they're starting to view those who were really coming to the forefront of being in opposition, not to um, health issues, but really to the church. And I think that's what we've seen, right? Um, and and just kind of help people refocus. I'm pretty sure Eki has too. I'm sure you have. Um, how should Christians be thinking about the world, especially here in the, in the Western world? And you're in Canada. I think you guys are a good maybe few years ahead of us in terms of just how strict and how antagonistic against the church your country is. But how are you helping people work through um, the, the the understanding that the, the world around you is a mission field? I mean, your church has been a great, I think, open you know demonstration of that. Um, but how should people be thinking in that way? What kind of things can they guard themselves against? And uh, yeah, pro how can they process that? Well, I think it'd be helpful to understand the Great Commission and have the Great Commission at the forefront. We are called to uh, go to the nations and make disciples, uh, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all that Christ has commanded us. That's our, our mission. And you make a disciple by proclaiming the gospel. So our mission on earth is to is to be faithful in the work of the Great Commission. And that requires being gospel proclaimers we are to preach the gospel share the gospel we're to to evangelize and so if we keep the the great commission at the forefront then that's going to be helpful as we see the world and its lunacy and and it really just coming apart at the scenes all around us especially here in the western world if we if we recognize the reason that we're on earth is to proclaim the gospel it's to see the kingdom advance one soul at a time, then that's going to help us to relate to the world properly. And I mean, this can go in a variety of ways because, you know, you on one side of the equation, you've got folks who are wanting to go to war with the world, but not really at war with it in the context of, you know, our weapons of warfare, the word of God, the gospel, but they just, they want to go into a political battle and fight and establish, you know, a Christian ethics, society, and culture. Uh, then on the other side of the equation, you've got those who have forgotten that the world hates you already, and, and you're trying to basically win friendship with the world by, by basically, you know, uh, yielding to all of its demands and requests to, 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 to be all that the world wants the church to be, thinking that that's going to get you somewhere with the gospel, and both are wrongheaded. I mean, the world hates us. That's clear. The, the hatred of the world just needs a moment to express itself. And COVID-19 with your church open was, was one of those times because you're, you're being the church with your church open and the world saying, don't be the church. We don't want you to be the church. And so I think, I think you've got issue on both sides of the ledger. But if you have the Great Commission at the forefront and then you're being faithful in that, like one of the things for Grace Life Church that was so helpful is that not only were we taking a stand that was in effect against the world for the headship of Christ over his church, but we utilized virtually every opportunity we had to share the gospel, 
to proclaim the gospel. So we were modeling how you can take a, a stand against the world, um, the flesh and the devil by, by being faithful to Christ and using the opportunities that result from that to actually proclaim the gospel. So those moments become redemptive in nature. Um, so I think having the Great Commission firmly in place is critical then utilizing the opportunities that you're given to share the gospel. And of course, now in our context, because we're seeing the fruitfulness of that stand where people have in fact come to Christ through that, or, or, you know, they were, they were nominal or backsliding Christians to, you know, however you wanted to find that. And it was through our stand that they were woken up. Maybe they got saved. Maybe they, maybe they were just in a bit of mediocrity and snapped out of it and are now walking with the Lord the way they ought. I think we're seeing the fruitfulness of that and that helps to, to keep things redemptive. And so I think, you know, it would be helpful if the church saw someone get saved, you know, if, if the church was going to be able to appreciate the, the, the saving grace of God afresh and, and was going to have a love for the lost, it's helpful to see someone who's lost get saved. And to do that, you've got to, you got to proclaim the gospel. And maybe that's helpful for pastors. Like I know for me, being in the doctor of ministry, for example, uh, Nathaniel, you can probably relate to this. Uh, Dr. Lawson preaches the gospel so effectively and, and he models faithful gospel preaching. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've wanted to emulate his gospel preaching in our pulpit. And if you, if you're proclaiming the gospel powerfully and effectively and clearly and precisely that that in and of itself is going to be a benefit to the preacher to the mm -hmm. congregant not just because we all need to hear the gospel repeatedly all the time but also because just hearing the gospel helps us to appreciate why it is that we're here and and even trains our people to then share in, uh, the gospel with others so i think even having a, an effective evangelistic component in the pulpit is critical mm -hmm. to cultivating that as well so I, I think the passage uh, that most people are familiar with is the passage from Matthew 28. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It, you know, as simple of a passage as this is, it is so easy uh, to be inundated by what's happening in the world that we just forget that really the Christian, you know, has a primary focus, right? And and this is it. I mean, ultimately, it's that we glorify God. Um, but but this is the thing that we should be seeking to do. Um, and and you're right, James. I think if we were to just very simplistically divide people up into the 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 temptations that we face, they would fall into the category of either kind of capitulating to win the world. Um, or, you know, being combative and feeling like you need to fight against the world. And I, and I understand those. I, I don't know about you guys, but occasionally, you know, I see what's going on in, it, you know, I mean, California is always a good example because whatever is the worst thing happening in the U.S., it's coming out of California first, yeah. right? And you, you read these laws and, you know, you just kind of get that thing that rises up in you uh, because it's so dark and so evil um, you know, guys listening now, the, the the most recent thing is California passing, trying to pass legislation where a 12 year old uh, can basically say, nope, I don't want to be parented by my parents anymore. And they can just choose to become wards of the state, basically. Um, if that kind of thing that passes, I, I get causes uh, a, a righteous indignation for that type of evil. But we can't lose focus that the reason these things are being passed is because you go to Ephesians, these people are dead in their sins and trespasses, right? They're following after the lust of the flesh, the prince of the power of the air. And so the the, the Christian, when we look at those guys, um, just help us maybe, James, if someone were to come to you and ask for counsel and they say, look, James, I'm uh, I, I'm just so angry at uh, the, the oppression the government is uh, bringing down on the church and the, just the wickedness. Um, I think you guys can right be put in jail for speaking out against the LGBTQ stuff if I've been keeping up with your laws rightly. How, how do you help counsel someone to sort of shift their mindset from 
uh, that that enemy view of the world to look. These people are in desperately need of Christ, and 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 rather than them be my enemy, although you know they're an enemy of Christ, what I want is to get to them to get the gospel to them, so that then we see some of these things maybe change um, on on the ground. Yeah, well, I think part of it they so they've got to repent of their anger. Step one, um, turn from your anger. So there's that too. I think they've got to understand the sovereignty of God. Romans one indicates that he abandons nations to themselves when they refuse to honor him or give him thanks. There's really an amazing dynamic there in Romans one, where the, the creature turns creation on its head by worshiping the creature. And so God in turn takes the creature and turns it on its head. And that's where you have, mm -hmm men desiring men, women desiring women. That's just a turning of creation uh, upside down. And it's the byproduct of God's judgment for refusing to worship him and instead worshiping the creature. So when you understand that what's happening in our world right now is a direct result of the sovereignty of God, God is sovereignly delivering our nations over to depravity. And we're, I mean, we're definitely at the point of a depraved mind. I mean, we're, we're well into this thing now. So, so when you realize that God is doing this and, and he's doing it as an expression of his glory, that helps to go, oh, okay, so, so what's happening right now? Like I'm obviously, you know, the sin that we're seeing in the society and culture around us, that's attributed to them. They're responsible for their sin. There's no question. But when you understand on a macro level that God and his sovereignty is handing them over for their refusal to worship him, that helps to, to then shape this a little bit to say, okay, then, then let's, let's think about how we're to relate to what's taking place. And I think on the one hand, yes, these are, these are moments for us to preach the gospel, proclaim Christ, call people to repentance. And, and certainly as the, the, the church shines brightly and the world gets darker and darker, those opportunities are going to increase. At the same time, these are opportunities for us as the church to glorify God, to, to put the lordship of Christ on display simply by being the salt and light that we're called to be. And that may not result in people being saved. It, it may actually just result in them increasing their judgment on the day of judgment. But, but we have an opportunity in this season to be the men and women that we're called to be. And so there should be a zeal. I mean, this is a, there's, there's never been a better time to be a Christian than right now. And to follow Christ and to make your life count for the glory of God and to live for eternity. Uh, this is it. So, so to be angry is short-sighted. It's a superficial response to what's taking place. It demonstrates a lack of um, just theological robustness to be able to analyze what's going on in our society and culture. And, and so it's, it's definitely deficient. It, that, you bring that's up a good a, point. A great yeah. Go ahead, Eki. No, that's um, th that's a great point. You you mentioned there's never been a better time to be a Christian, at least in our lifetimes, than right now. Um, flesh that out a little bit, because I think as people look around and say, well, how can you say that with rising opposition and rising hostility? I would think it would have been a much better time to be a Christian when this nation, for instance, America, had more Christian values. But now that that's being eschewed, that's being thrown aside— how is it that you can say it is a better time to be a Christian? Is there a special or unique opportunity uh, opportunity that we have because of the climate that we're in? Well, Scripture says that judgment begins with the household of God, 1 Peter 4. So, so there's a principle there. Also, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 indicates that the suffering that the Thessalonians experienced was evidence that they were fit for the kingdom of God. So when you're when you're in an era where... Christianity is largely being accepted and you're not really being tested or confronted with the cost of what it is to follow Christ, though there are benefits to that kind of tranquil and quiet life that we that we want to live, First Timothy 2, uh, there's a sense in which now you get to put your faith to the test. Like now you get to stand up and really see if you're willing to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Christ. Now comes with a cost. So if you think of Grace Life Church, our people have already gotten to taste what it is to follow Christ when there's a cost. 
you know, there's been jobs that have been lost, right? There were, there were folks that lost their jobs because they weren't willing to be vaccinated or whatever the case may be. Uh, there was a ton of pressure and hostility as our church was in the news. And, and that was coming from family. It was coming from employers, employees, neighbors. So, so there's an opportunity for you to, to prove that your faith in Christ is authentic and, and so what, what better way to be tested than when it's difficult to follow Christ, when it's a challenge to follow Christ. And, and so I think just, just the concept of being, um, being tested to, to see whether we truly are fit for the kingdom of God, that we truly have a share in that kingdom through our faith in Christ. I think that in and of itself is immensely valuable. Amen. Yeah, you know, James, as you were talking, I was thinking it would probably do many Christians uh, good to remember that uh, our job is to pursue faithfulness and not result, right? And, and I think we're we're very results driven. Uh, you know, pastors tend to be results driven, um, and but but we've got to pull back and remember that you know we're gonna, when we answer to the Lord, it'll be for our faithfulness, right? Not the the results are ultimately up to Him, and I think. It, you mentioned Romans one, and that's very interesting uh, because um, I, I I think just about everyone I talk to would recognize that we're in that kind of scenario where God's hand of judgment is uh, is is on our nation. Um, I, I'm sure you guys. I don't know how you wouldn't feel that way about yours either. I feel that way about yours, although I don't live there. Um, but but then there's just sort of almost this disconnect from. The, that realization and then understanding, well, if if this is God's hand of judgment, then the solution has to be God's solution, right? Um, and, and that's always just been the same, right? U ultimately, if God wants to destroy America, and he very well may, um, then that's what he's going to do. But he hasn't changed, you know, the, the commission. Uh, he, he hasn't changed uh, the expectation for his people to worship him, to glorify him, to meet together, to share the gospel. And so really it, what you're describing in its totality is sort of being spiritually minded, right? Um, rather than getting sucked into just kind of the worldly ways of thinking and being distracted. Yeah, also take Christian nationalism. So you've got all these folks talking right now about how they want to essentially Christianize the U.S., Canada, ultimately that if you're post-millennial means the whole world, but let's just take, you know, North America. Uh, if you're going to make these nations Christian, you have to overcome Romans one. I mean, our nations are under the judgment of God. He has abandoned us. And, and the reason he did is because of a refusal to worship him. So if you're going to reverse what's happening in our culture and society, it's an issue of worship. You're going to have to bring these countries and nations to a place of worshiping Christ. And there's only one way to do that. And it's through the gospel because it's through the gospel that God administers the effectual call that results in regeneration, where we are brought to life to believe on Christ. And so apart from that, there's no Christianizing of these, of these countries. It is, it is impossible. In fact, I would say it's an exercise in futility because you are essentially working against the sovereignty of God. Mm. That's quite the statement, working against the sovereignty yeah. of God. But I think that's true, you know. So let um, me um, ask you a couple of questions, if I may. Um, be, you guys are going through uh, even more intense kind of government opposition to God than, than we're seeing here in America. And when you get someone that comes to you and say, I ask you, should I be moving to someplace where it's more safe? Uh, should we consider going to the U.S.? Should we consider going someplace else to to get away from this? Um, how do you respond? What, how do you counsel someone through that kind of decision making? Well, it depends. I mean, you know, I think right now the big discussion is this whole like strategizing thing where you got the post millennial guys talking about a strategy of, you know, Christians flocking to the same red state to kind of, I guess, be the home base for you know, establishing a, a kingdom presence to then advance across the nation. And, you know, as soon as you, so 
the biggest problem with post-millennialism is that it's not in the Bible. So any strategy that you establish that's connected to an expectation that your nation or the world is going to be Christianized is an exercise in futility as well. So, so there's that. Now, as you're speaking to an individual, if they want to move to a particular state, they want to flee a particular place, I mean, they're free to do that. There's nothing preventing them from doing that. You can talk to them about their, their, their desires and motivations for doing that. And certainly as you get into some of that, there may be opportunity to pastor their heart, shepherd their heart and, and redirect, you know, fears that are misplaced or whatever the case may be. But I mean, yeah, if, if, if someone wants to move, you know, into the States from Canada because they want to flee, you know, Justin Trudeau, that's, they're free to do that. I mean, th there's, there's nothing preventing them from doing that. You know, in my case, I'm probably not going to do that because I have a flock. And so I'm not going to leave the sheep behind to to flee a tyrant. But um, but yeah, so it's just it depends. You, you have to deal with each case yeah. as it is. But and then, you know what, like you could you could decide you could say, I want to implement a strategy to um, to bring about the biggest impact in steering, let's say, a state or a particular city toward a more Christian ideal. I mean, again, you can do that. I mean, you, cause you can still do that and fulfill the great commission, wherever you're going, right. there's going to be unbelievers. So you can preach the gospel there. So you could, you could do that and it would be fine. You're allowed to do that. No, there's, there's nothing forbidding you from doing that. But if you tie that to an expectation that it's going to be successful yeah. when the Bible does not promise that mm -hmm. that's where um, you're, 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 you're very misguided. Yeah, I've I've um, I, I've stated that uh, um, each person needs to make that decision what's best for them and the family, but also examine their heart for what their motives are and whether those motives uh, align with uh, with the motives of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we see in the Bible. So let me ask you this: in terms of politics, because a lot of this ends up turning into uh, okay, what's the Christian's relationship to politics? Um, what is your personal philosophy? Because though you're not post millennial. Um, I also suspect that you're not apolitical. So what is the responsibility that we as Christians have with regards to politics, the political arena around us? Yeah, I think as citizens and as Christian citizens, citizens who are Christian, I think we do have a responsibility to uh, to be involved in uh, the political discourse. And, and, and that at the basic level, that just means vote. So at minimum, we should be voting. We should be trying to um, to contribute to uh, the the state of our our political climate by means of voting as righteously as we possibly can, and there are other ways to be involved. If you can be, uh, I wouldn't make it a priority in my particular context because I've got a very focused uh, lifestyle that's that's devoted to Christ and and ministering to His church. We're going to have folks in our church who are more inclined in that direction, and they can. They can certainly do that. We would just exhort them to do it in a Christ-like manner, as far as their involvement is concerned, and and certainly to ensure that they're not they're not you know um, so committed to that that they're actually coming up short on their real responsibilities to the Lord. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, no, I mean, I can say even in our province, the stand that we took has shifted the political climate at least for a season. Um, that the premier who was conservative is no longer the premier. We now have a new conservative premier. She came in to replace him partway through his term, and then she just won an election. So I think our stand in our province was effective in establishing a, a more conservative ethic. In fact, our province, the government of our province is now saying no to the federal government. So we actually showed and I think I can say this, we showed our, our provincial government how to say no to our federal government. So in the past, what would happen is this, wow. the federal government would impose some law on our province and our province would then respond by taking the federal government to court. But until like that takes forever for that to, to, to be worked out. And until then you're, you're complying with the federal government and what they've imposed upon you. Now our province is saying no. We're not going to comply with that unjust edict. We have our own jurisdiction, so we're gonna we're gonna do that. Then it's gonna go to the court because the the federal government's gonna take us to court now, and and then it'll, it'll get worked out that way. So we've shown on a variety of levels how mm -hmm. to say no to a higher level of authority, 
And, and so I can say without a doubt that even just by being the church, without even being political by way of a, mm -hmm. a, a motivation, like we weren't trying to be political. We realized that our stand had political implications and we, we understand that it took us into the limelight of politics on some level, but we were just being the church. We were just trying to glorify Christ and it certainly had an impact. And I, I think, I think that's really helpful too, as far as the lost is concerned is when they see that following Christ actually makes a difference. I mean, when the mm -hmm. unbeliever can look at the church's stand and go like, wow, there's an institution that's doing something beneficial for society that in and of itself might gain a hearing for the gospel. And I think in some cases it has for sure. And if I may ask your eschatology, you're not post-mill. Are you pre-mill or a-mill? I'm pre-mill. You're pre-mill. So despite sharing, and I'm, I'm pre-mill as well, um, Nathaniel's a-mill. He's considering pre-mill right now. But anyway, I'm the odd duck. despite the common objection about pre-mill being a quote-unquote loser eschatology, or perhaps pre-mills being blamed for being apolitical or being careless or reckless about what's going on around them, I think the testimony you're sharing shows that you can be pre-mill and still seek to be salt and light and to, to preserve what is good and to even affect good around you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we could we could certainly use you know things that are going on in the context of our church right now, but we were just on a TMF, so a master's fellowship a call with John MacArthur. And if you could hear everything that they are doing, Grace Community Church, uh, TMAI around the world, uh, there's a, a big a big push right now for for impacting children at the the school level. And so, yeah, without a doubt, I mean, the the motivation is different though. We're we're not trying to conquer the world. We're we're not trying mm -hmm. to Christianize society. We're 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 just being faithful to our Lord. And, and seeking to build up his church, call people to repentance, be, 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 be salt and light. And so, yeah, without a doubt, I mean, the motivation is different, but the, the orthopraxy is in, in, in some respects similar, very similar. Yeah, I, think I think this the, is a vital focus. distinction. <clears throat> yes. I, yeah, I'm sorry, I, one, I think real this quick. is such... Go ahead, Aki. <laughs> sorry. Nathaniel, to your point, faithfulness. And, and, and I think what you're describing, James is faithfulness. When you say we're not seeking after result in society, we're not trying to Christianize the nation and all that. I think what you're saying is that we're not focused on the result. We're focused upon the process that is prescribed to us by our Lord. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah that That's exactly the point I was going to bring out. Um, <laughs> it, it is just that, you know, it, it, you, you know, you, you guys are operating the way Christians should. You're just being Christians and in God's sovereignty. He he changed some of the political dynamics in your province, right? Um, but but that was never the aim, the goal. The goal was just very simply to be faithful to what Christ has told the church to do, right? To be faithful to what Christians should do. And then yeah. e even if it went the other direction, right? And and for you for a season it did, right? For you in the beginning to be faithful meant you spent time away from your family in prison. Um, and, and so it's just the difference between trying to uh, mastermind, uh, it, it, you know, an outcome versus just being faithful and trusting God's sovereignty in it. Yeah. And, and keep this in mind. I mean, so that, that all went down at, um, sort of the 10 year mark and following of my ministry. So for 10 years, I'm just doing faithful Bible exposition. And, and there might be some from the outside looking in, just wondering if all of that you know, expository preaching is, is having any difference? Is it, mm. is it affecting, you know, society and culture or anything else? And of course it's impacting the life of the church and the, the, the individuals that make up the, the church of Grace Life Church, but it's, it was building. Like we were in that time when things weren't that exciting and that thrilling, and it was rather mundane. We were building and equipping and preparing and making ourselves ready for whatever day would come. And it's funny. I go back to my, to some old sermons that I just, I want to check something out. What did I say here? What did I say there on different issues? And, and I, I can see how an application I'm talking about, like the, the, the this persecution that's no doubt going to come in the future, even back in 2013. And so I, I was constantly talking about it and mentioning it to our people that a day is going to come. We can see the writing on the wall and we were building and preparing and equipping all the way until the time came. And by God's grace, praise the Lord, we were able to stand. 
Mm. I th- this is a good place to kind of jump in as we look at winding down the podcast um, and, and asking the question: How can we help people sort of cultivate or rekindle this this love for the gospel, for the proclamation of the gospel, uh, for having a right focus? Um, and it, you know, this is just that point you made there about how over these this decade you've been preparing people for the promise of persecution. Um, and, and that's why, you know, eschatology can really matter, right? Um, but because if you're teaching, things can get better, and then all of a sudden they're not. People can become easily discouraged and uh, just unsure of what they've been taught. But for 10 years, you've been teaching people how to respond in in the midst of what Scripture promises every believer is going to endure at some stage, Right. Um, and, and so the response was, well, now what the world largely saw. So maybe we've got guys who are listening and they're thinking, man, you know, I, I've gotten caught up in kind of, you know, the, the the scheming to manipulate, you know, politics and change things and make it more Christian. Or, you know, another category of people uh, that I often run into are just kind of a little afraid, you know, a little apprehensive about the future. They're not really sure about things. Um, for those people who are listening and they're thinking, well, I, I, I see I need to get back to just the Christian focus, right? And clearly we see it is very practical um, because living like a Christian, God uses in his sovereign ways. Uh, if he wants to change the dynamics of a province through a faithful church, he'll do it. Um, if the church needs some persecution to be strengthened in their own faith, I mean, we've seen God, right, uh, left enemies in the land for his people because they needed uh, they needed that. W- what are some ways those people can start kind of coming back to center? W- what are some of, and, and I know the first thing you'll mention is the necessity of the local church, um, but w- w- what other things would, would you say there? I think in some cases, it'd probably be helpful to disengage somewhat from social media um there, there's a, a discussion that's happening uh in social media at this point in time and for me i'm not on social media but i hear about it from my wife and i would describe it as like a car wreck that you just can't turn away from and and so if you can if you can watch the car wreck taking place and just sort of be at a distance without getting <clears throat> enthralled in it then then that's fine but if you can't if if, if you just get sucked in where all you're doing is talking about what you ought to be doing, but you're not actually doing what you ought to be doing. Um, I would just say that there may need to be a a disengaging from social media. And, um, and I think, you know, you know, putting that aside for a moment, I think it's critical to cultivate uh, obedience. I think there there needs to be a, a serious intentional cultivation of spirit empowered obedience in the Christian life, because, those are the muscles that you're going to have to flex when it gets difficult. You're going to be brought to a fork in the road where it's either going to be obey Christ and suffer or don't and take the easy road. And you want to obey Christ and suffer every time. And you're not going to, unless you're already flexing, working those muscles of obedience um, uh, long before you get there. And so I think there's got to be a, a commitment to, to obedience and that just your whole life gets brought into view at that point in time from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed i mean everything is under the lordship of christ and so you know what you watch as far as entertainment the time you spend in the word and prayer all of those things become critical points of uh focus and 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 even for the the most mature christians there's always an analyzing of that there's always a, a revisiting of all of those things to ensure that you're you're properly aligned with the Lordship of Christ and living for his glory. So, so yeah, you, you kind of took one of my cards away by saying, you know, commitment to a local church, you want to be under sound, sound preaching of the word of God in the context of a local church where you can grow as a vital member of that church. But, um, but certainly unplugging from social media would be helpful and, and, and ensuring that you're cultivating obedience in your life. Talking about the local church, uh, thinking about how much I don't know about Canada, to what extent would you tell a believer um, it's important to to do whatever it takes to get into a solid 
Bible expositional preaching church? I mean, is it is it sort of like where where is that on the importance level for you? Yeah, I'd say it's the it's it's the top. It's number one. So and especially now, right? Like especially mm-hmm. now, but it, it's it's number one. It's more important than your job. It's it's obviously you've got a responsibility to provide, but if if like your first choice of job takes you away from a sound local church to where there is no mm-hmm. sound local church, well then that that can't be the job. I mean, you, you've got to you've got to provide for your family, and the mm-hmm. Lord in His graciousness is never going to have you choosing between providing and church. Like He's going to provide, He's going to give you both. It may not may not be your your preferred job, but nevertheless it's going to be feasible so yeah i think it's number one i think you got to be in a sound local church and i've seen it i mean people who aren't plugged into a sound local church there's so much they're missing so much they don't get and and i've got examples that i could reference right now but i won't just because uh, i don't want to you know invoke the the individuals that it, that it impacts but when you when you plant churches for example you find out real quick that the individuals who weren't necessarily as far along in the Christian life as you thought they were, um, well, that they aren't. And so, so there's no question. You've got to be a part of a local church where the word is being preached, where, where body life is healthy. There's so much organic sanctification that takes place in that context that you just cannot replicate through any other means. And, uh, and so you've got to be a part of a sound local church without a doubt. Amen. Well, brothers, uh, James, I really appreciate you joining us for this episode. I think that's just uh, really insightful, especially for for guys who are in the West, uh, hearing you say these things in a place that's, you know, just if you can imagine, even worse than what we are in the U.S. Um, I, I want to leave us with a, a, a verse you referenced. I think you referenced earlier, John 15, 18. Christians just can't forget this, right? This is This is just one of those promises in Scripture, and you've done so well. Um, in equipping your people to uh, be ready for persecution that, well, the whole world saw the fruit of that, right? And praise God um, that he was glorified through it. John 15, 18, Jesus says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you pretty definitive statements there. Um, And so, well, thank you for your faithfulness, James. Uh, Thank you guys for joining us on the podcast today. I hope that this has been helpful to you. And until next time, let the truth be known. The Truth Be Known podcast is a theologically driven, gospel-centered program serving the body of Christ by bringing biblical truth to bear on issues facing the church today. Subscribe to the Truth Be Known podcast by using the podcast app on your Apple or Android device or listen online at strivingforeternity.org in the podcast section.